Namaskar and a very pleasant good afternoon to all of you. Distinguished speaker of today's webinar, Dr. Shantanu Kumar, MD and CEO, World Sigma Consulting, Dr. S.S. Murthy, Vice President Delnet, Dr. P.R. Goswami, Treasurer Delnet, well known library experts, library and information science professionals who have joined us from different parts of India and also from other countries, students. Ladies and gentlemen, I, Sangeeta Call, on behalf of Delnet, extends a very hearty welcome to each one of you to today's Delnet webinar, which is on Lean Six Sigma for enhancing service quality. We have with us this afternoon, Dr. Shantanu Kumar, MD and CEO of World Sigma Consulting. I take profound privilege in welcoming you, Dr. Shantanu, and thank you so much for acceding to our request to be there with us this afternoon. You have been very kind and generous in accepting our invitation. We are much grateful to you for your very kind presence with us. It's a Pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Shantanu Kumar, who holds a great expertise on the Six Sigma concepts. And we are indeed very happy to have him with us this afternoon, who is going to apprise you very shortly about the Lean Six Sigma concepts and how we, the library and information science professionals who are working in the libraries, tirelessly to see that we are able to ensure, we are able to provide the good quality services to our users. We are going to learn by heaps and bounds today the Six Sigma concepts, and this is going to be delivered by no one else other than Dr. Shantanu Kumar, who holds a great name in this field of Six Sigma. And he leads the company War Sigma, which has a great reputation with its offices in across in all nooks and parts of the world. We are indeed privileged to have him with us uh, this afternoon to deliver this very special talk on Lean Six Sigma for enhancing service quality. Dr. Shantanu Kumar has influenced and tra transformed the path organizations treat on for process imp improvement, innovation, and change management. A prominent author, speaker, and business consultant, Dr. Kumar is universally characterized by his friends, colleagues, and clients as one of the most insightful, influential, and recommended strategy consultant, and is respected for his years of research in the fields of process improvement, business intelligence, and innovation. Dr. Shantanu Kumar has enabled most Fortune 500 companies across industries to improve operations efficiency, re-engineer obsolete and dying processes, reinvigorate business strategies, and turn around failing businesses. He has trained and consulted on innovations using TRIS, Lean Six Sigma, program and project management, business process re-engineering, strategic leadership, and managing change. He has trained more than 10,000 professionals on Lean Six Sigma innovation, structured decision making, and business process reengineering across industries, and touched many more lives in other leadership workshops. He uses his diverse life experiences to deliver workshops, and we are pretty sure about it that we are going to experience the same in, in yet another few minutes. It's a pleasure for us to welcome Dr. Shantanu Kumar once again, and I would not like to stand between you and our attendees who have joined us from various parts of the country and also outside, and they really look forward to gain a lot. Profound privilege for me to request Dr. Shantanu to you to kindly take the session forward. It's over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it is overwhelming. Thank you, Delnet. Thank you, Dr. Call, distinguished members and participants. I am really delighted to be amongst all of you today to share my experiences, especially in Lean Six Sigma implementation across industries. However, the idea for today's session is not to inflict a long speech. I know 45 minutes to an hour listening to somebody, that's boring. So what I would do is I will only talk about the basic construct of Lean Six Sigma as a framework. The idea is to know the questions on your mind, and then we engage in an interaction where I can take your questions. Now, for today, what I want to look at is that at the end of this session, you should know answers to three questions. What is Lean Six Sigma? And I understand Lean and Six Sigma are two different methodologies put together. How can we apply or at least look at Lean Six Sigma as a management framework in any enterprise. It doesn't need to be 
a traditional for-profit business. It can be a not-for-profit business. It can be a library. And that's when we ask the next question. Can we apply the philosophy and principles that we learn from Lean Six Sigma in our daily lives? Can it be part of our personal activities? How do we improve our personal lives using the same philosophy? Before we get into these questions, let's understand the questions that most of you would have in your mind. That is, what is Lean Six Sigma? Is it some kind of a number metric? Because when you Google search, you hear these numbers, 3.4 DPMO. So people start thinking it is some kind of a metric. Then when you Google search a little more, you get to see that there is some DMAIC methodology, DMADV methodology. And then some of you also may have worked with organizations who use it as a management system. And then another thing that is thrown around is Y equal to FX. And it sounds like some fancy equation. So what does that mean? Another concern that a lot of participants have that when they Google search, and I'm, I'm the reason why I keep saying Google search is because the first thing that most people do when they hear a new term is go online and search. And unfortunately, when we take a cursory glance at Wikipedia or some article, more questions arise than answers. So the next question that a lot of people have asked, isn't it for manufacturing? Is it really for service? And are these tools not some new tools that Motorola came up with? So I want to take these questions first. So let's understand the purpose. Let's look at if you're a customer, what are the three things you're worried about? You're worried about quality, cost, and delivery. And a lot of people keep thinking that businesses are worried about something else. They're also worried about the same three things. They're worried about quality, cost, and delivery. Lean Six Sigma helps the businesses achieve quality, cost, and delivery for their customers. And that's the purpose of Lean Six Sigma. Now, I'm not going to use presentations throughout the session. I want to first ask you a bunch of questions. Uh, if the chat window is open, I will be happy if you, you can share your answers. How old do you think are these tools? Less than 40 years, 40 to 100 years, greater than 100 years. So let's engage in a discussion. Let's not make it a long speech. So how old are Lean Six Sigma tools? Less than 40 years, 40 to 100 years, greater than 100 years. Whatever little searching, reading you did, what's your thought? That's pretty much the perception. The perception is that Lean Six Sigma is something that Motorola started. So the tools in Lean Six Sigma are also tools generated, developed, curated by Motorola, that isn't true. So let's talk about Six Sigma a little more. And I'm gonna take you away from these PowerPoint slides, which are very boring. And I want to use uh, a mind map. I don't know whether any of you use mind maps, but I enjoy it. So when you look at Lean Six Sigma and you talk about Six Sigma, most of the tools of Six Sigma are more than 100 years old. Now, another question that you would have is, where do these tools come from? Most of these tools are from different subjects. Primary subjects would be operations management, statistical research, supply chain in the initial years. Then over the years, risk management got added. And this was added, a lot of the tools that we're looking at, these are from the Second World War. And you even have financial management. So what I wanted to emphasize here is, when you look at the tools and techniques in Lean Six Sigma, and you look at the MBA curriculum, you would find a significant overlap. So nobody can say that there are tools only from a specific subject, and these tools are only applicable to a specific domain. So what was the purpose of Six Sigma? Motorola compiled, tried and tested tools from across industries, across functions. And that was in the 1980s. And the entire focus was reduce variation, reduce defects. Because this had an impact on their cost. This has a, had an impact on customer retention. So if they don't reduce variation, don't reduce defects, it reduces, it increases their cost and reduces their ability to retain customers. And that was the entire focus of Motorola. And we're going to come to lean in just a moment. 
Now, most of these tools are not developed by Motorola. They copied and pasted. So when, when you attend a Lean Six Sigma training program or proper training program over many days, if you start searching each of these tools, you would be surprised that none of these tools are even from the 1980s. Correlation regression is from the 19th century. Uh, experimentation models are from the early 20th century. Some of the risk management concepts are also from uh, the early 20th century, the World War period. So what Motorola did was they picked up the tools, compiled them, and they found a way to apply it to reduce variation, reduce defects. And when I say variation, I mean inconsistency. One of the biggest challenges in business is to be consistent. And I'm certain, so a lot of you may be watching cricket or some other sport, and you may see that there is a very talented player, whether it's cricket, football, any sport, but you always keep telling yourself, oh, I hope he or she would have been a little more consistent. If he or she could have been a little more consistent, they would probably be the greatest of all time. And you may have that kind of an opinion. And that's true for business too. So Motorola picked up these tools and techniques and the, with the focus of reducing variation, reducing defects. Now, this was late 1980s. Now, during this period, Lean as a concept was introduced. And once again, this is a copied and pasted concept. So there is this research professor, James Womack, and I'll quickly show you his Wikipedia profile. He was studying for his PhD in industrial practices. And what he did was he visited Japan, Germany, and America. Of course, he's from America, so he compared Japan, Germany with American practices. And he observed something fascinating about Japan. They could do more with less. So one of the things that he started emphasizing was do more with less. He observed that Japan could produce the same output or more consistently with better quality day over day, week over week, month over month in smaller factories with lesser resources. And this is a period when he started saying that American organizations carry a lot of fat. And what is fat? Fat, according to James Womack, was excess resources that we use. So instead of, let's say, a 10,000 square feet facility, if we are using 50,000 square feet facility, instead of 30 resources, we are using 70 resources. Instead of five machines, we are using 10 machines. And he started saying that we need to trim this fat for us to provide better value to our customers. And then there was a big discussion, value. And the discussion was it has to be defined by customer. So I'll, before I go any further, I'll quickly take you to a quick Wikipedia page. So this is the Wikipedia page of James Womack. And if you get an opportunity, you can take a look at the IMVP program. And he coined the term lean. So the term lean was coined by James Womack. The term lean is not a Japanese term. So he coined the term lean because he wanted to make American organizations leaner. He wanted to reduce fat in those enterprises. And he started his own institute, Lean Enterprise Institute. And he also worked on another book known as Learning to See. The objective of that book was that you need to develop an eye to look out for waste and remove waste. So the objective of Lean is to reduce waste, improve flow. Now there's something interesting that happened in the late 90s. So you had one group of guys practicing Six Sigma, which was all about reducing variation, reducing defects. You had another group of professionals working on reducing waste, reducing, uh, improving flow. Flow means how quickly can you get the job done? 
So if, you, if you're confused about what is flow, flow is how quickly can you get the job done? So the customer places an order today, how quickly can you complete that request and respond with the product or service? In the late 1990s, a lot of professionals started saying that there is a synergy that we can explore. And the synergy is that can we, can we combine the lean and the Six Sigma practices? Now, please keep in mind, six, Lean Six Sigma is not by Motorola. Motorola standardized Six Sigma practices and Lean practices were introduced by James Womack and his team. But these were the Lean Six Sigma professionals who introduced Lean Six Sigma as one methodology framework that they could apply. And their entire focus was that how do we increase revenue for an enterprise how do we reduce waste how do we optimize profit margins how do we maintain quality standards and how do we improve our processes now in the last 20 years lean six sigma has evolved from the traditional definition of lean and six sigma and the best way to understand this would be to understand a framework So if you look at the Motorola period of Lean Six Sigma, Lean or and sorry, Six Sigma was implemented as a methodology. But by the time GE or General Electric started using Lean Six Sigma and other organizations started using Six Sigma and Lean practices, they realized that if we have to apply Lean Six Sigma to the entire organization, there has to be more structure to it. And the structure was decided as that we should start with metric, methodology, management system, and slowly graduate to a culture where Lean Six Sigma is a way of life. Now, I will illustrate this with some examples. And so stay patient. And I'll pick up a new mind map. Let me explain this. So let's talk about the Lean Six Sigma maturity continuum. So what did these organizations emphasize? So the first thing they mentioned was that every organization should have a metric level of maturity. What is a metric level of maturity? You standardize your existing processes. And a lot of you may have these ISO certifications for your businesses for your um, organizations the objective here is there has to be a standardized way of operating then the next thing was there must be a scorecard so establish scorecard preferably scorecard that looks at financial indicators looks at the customer looks at internal business process and also looks at learning and growth some of you may know this as a balanced scorecard. So some of you may know this as a balanced scorecard. So in the first level of maturity, when we approach an organization, the first thing we look out, have they standardized their, their existing process? So there should not be many versions of doing the same thing. Second, is there a scorecard? And what do I mean by a scorecard? It should be, it should have a list of performance parameters that I can review daily, weekly, monthly. And based on those parameters, I can initiate corrective action, preventive action. So there should be review of scorecard KPIs, key performance indicators. So when I'm referring to KPIs, I'm referring to key performance indicators. And when, once we review these KPIs, if there is any underperforming KPI, which is not doing a good job, so any performance indicator tells you that for this process indicator, we are not doing a good enough job. So what do we do? We initiate corrective action, preventive action. Now, this is, this is the minimum maturity that we need to start with. And here, we are still not talking about fancy projects. This is what we expect from any unit. And it doesn't need to be for profit enterprises also, even for not profit. And one of the best examples of non-profit enterprise that worked with us 
is Rangde. And if you guys get an opportunity, you can check out Rangde's website. So Rangde's founders reached out to me 10 years ago and uh, more than 10 years ago, as far as I recollect. I don't particularly remember the year, but at least 10 years ago. And th the two founders mentioned that Shamsnu, we don't want to run a not-for-profit enterprise as how people view a not-for-profit enterprise. We want to run it as a professional enterprise. We want to deliver the best quality of service to the people, uh, to the lives we touch. And within the same amount of money, we want to touch more lives. And I, I love that quote. I still remember uh, Ram uh, is one of the founders and Smitha is the other founder. Um, Rangde is a microfinance company helping people uh, with funds. So if you look at them, I was surprised that they had this kind of a view that with the same amount of money, how do we touch more lives? How do we ensure that we have a structured process? How do we ensure that we internally review? Are we doing a good job, bad job? And whenever we realize we aren't doing a good enough job, we initiate corrective action, preventive action. Now, what happens is some of these metrics become a chronic pain area. What does that mean? So there is a pain area in your enterprise that you tried fixing, but you were not able to fix, or you were able to fix partially. Now, those kind of pain areas require a full-on attack for you to fix it. So you want to mobilize the team and attack that chronic pain area. So the objective here was that you identify periodically chronic pain areas and you apply a structured roadmap for process product service improvement. And the target here was chronic pain areas. And this is important for you to distinguish. If you have a one-off pain area, that means you observe a problem today, we resolve it by problem solving. But a chronic pain area is the pain area has been persistent. We have tried numerous initiatives to fix it and we haven't been able to fix it. So it's time for us to engage a cross-functional team and attack it head on. And this is when Motorola introduced the MAIC. So Motorola introduced MAIC. So that's an interesting story. This is how much Six Sigma has evolved. DMAIC as a methodology, define phase was not added by Motorola. It was added by General Electric. So DMAIC stands for define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. They also introduce another interesting methodology, which is DMADV. Define, measure, analyze, design, verify or validate now what is the key difference between the two the key difference between the two is what kind of improvement do you require and let me explain that with an example think of the following scenario and some of you may remember this let's say 30 to 40 years ago you had to withdraw cash from bank let's consider that so cash withdrawal from a bank. And you probably had to, there would be five touch points, four to five touch points. So you would first get a token. And um, after a token, you, so let me write it here. So you will get a token, then maybe a passbook update. Then you would, share a check that you would or any instrument to withdraw cash then they will sign off on the check then you get another token then you go to the teller and they the teller gives you the cash so these are four to five touch points now when we look at improvement for this kind of a scenario there are two ways you can look at improvement in this scenario one way is that you say from five touch points can we reduce it to one touch point another way of looking at it is why do we need a bank
or why do we need to go to a bank to withdraw cash? And another way of looking at it is, why do we need cash? Now, what is the key difference? All are improvements. So when you look at five touch points to one or two touch points, and when you look at another question that you ask, that do we really need a bank to withdraw cash? And then you go even further and you ask, why do we need cash? So what are you essentially asking? Let me place it on the screen. You're asking, are we looking at incremental improvement or are we gunning for radical change? So DMAIC, or Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, Control, was developed for incremental improvement. So instead of four to five touch points, you still go to a bank, you still withdraw money, but instead of four, four to five touch points, you have one or two touch points, or maybe there is also an appointment setting option so that you don't have to wait that long. So it's still the same process. You're still going to a bank. Radical change, which is define, measure, analyze, design, verify. This is where you start saying, why not an ATM? Why not a grocery store as an ATM? So some of you may remember that we have used grocery stores in our countries now during the post the demonetization period as ATMs for less than 2000 rupees. And why not? Why not think of digital wallets? Why do we need cash at all? So when you look at the second level of maturity, as methodology, the discussion here is very simple. The discussion is that the organization has to look at the chronic pain area and ask, do we need incremental improvement or do we need radical change? So they choose between DMAIC and DMADV. DMAIC, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. The critical difference here is design. So we are looking at a new way of operating. Now, these are to solve chronic pain areas. Now comes the next question. The next question is, if I want to run my business using the same principles of Lean Six Sigma, what, do, what should I do? What I need is a management system, which you may call as a framework. So this framework, becomes the guiding principle of running a business. And in this, you ask only five questions. What should we improve? What is our current performance and gap? What are the factors responsible for gap? How do we bridge these gaps and how do we sustain improved performance so if you can answer these five questions and you use these five questions as the guiding questions to run your organization when you're doing strategy planning you ask the same questions what should we improve? What is our current performance in gap? What are the factors responsible for it? How do we bridge these gaps? How do we sustain improved performance? When you look at these five questions to guide you, you are able to drive improvement initiatives in your enterprise. And I, I'm going to uh, discuss the framework a little more, a little later in this uh, discussion. Motorola and some of the other organizations could do immensely well when they started looking at metric methodology management system but one of the things that they could never achieve at the same level as some of the japanese organizations and that was philosophy and i am certain this is a concern that you may have observed in your organization so when you look at an organization pyramid you have senior management you, then you have middle management, then you have supervisor level, and then you have frontline workers. Even if you drive it top down and you engage the senior management, the middle managers, how do you create a culture 
that your shop floor employees, your frontline employees, look at their daily work from a from from the perspective that there is a better way to do this, there's a better way to serve our customers, and there's a better way to operate. So the question here was, how do we create a data-driven decision-making culture at the bottom of the pyramid? And how do we encourage innovation-fueled solutions? Now, unfortunately, not a lot of organizations have been successful in creating a culture or driving this philosophy in their enterprise. And to emphasize the fact, I can share an interesting example here, and that will probably help you. So think of the last time you had to move your house. Did any of you move your house maybe in the last three, four, five years? What are the issues or worries that you had? when you were moving your house. What is it that concerned you the most? Please share your answers in the chat window. So you were moving your house, you hired a movers and packers. What were the things that concerned you the most? And let me list down some of the questions. So most people are concerned about some of the following issues. And I'm, I'm certain some of you have also you uh, faced these issues when you moved last time to another house. They didn't carry enough boxes. or the truck was too small or they didn't have packing material or the way they packed it packed the fragile items there was a significant probability of breakage you were also concerned the kind of damage they did to the building when they were moving heavy items. You may also be concerned when they were moving things like television or they were moving items like uh, your cutlery, expensive cutlery, plates, dishes, fragile items. Now, when you look at this, and I, the reason I wanted to pick up movers and packers as an example is this is what emphasizes the lean principles. Now, when you look at one of the best examples to understand the lean principles would be to look at movers and pa packers in Japan. So the movers and packers in Japan engage the bottom of the pyramid, the guys who actually come to your house to move to another house, and they asked, what are the common reasons for defects? And they looked at everything as a defect. So if they don't ca carry enough packing material, if the truck is too small, if they have damaged the building, if they're packed fragile items in a way that it will break, or if they're carrying a television and the television can get damaged or your dishes can get damaged. In all of it, they started asking, how do we improve this process? And they had two things in mind. First, customer satisfaction. And second, can we do this in a way which is cost effective? So they looked at two outcomes, which a lot of people think are opposing effects that either you satisfy a customer or you reduce cost. So I want to show you a quick video and it will be an interesting video for you to take a look. So let me show you a quick video on movers and packers and this will probably help you understand the basic improvements they did so one of the first things they did here was 
when they captured the requirement when they captured the requirement they click pictures of your house to see what are the items and then logged all the items in a database that's what you see here this automatically created a minimum requirement of packing material a minimum requirement of resources so this entire concept of estimation of packing material estimation of resources estimation of freight capacity was based on requirements gathering and they created a method they created a process so that they can capture all this information now a lot of the indian organizations have also done this in the recent years here comes the moving day which is even more interesting in the moving day one of the first things they did was they started looking at how you can move things faster so if you look at the shoe box this is what we call a, a lean way of moving a shoe box instead of packing separate shoes they created one shoe box where they placed all the shoes this significantly reduced their cost of labor if you have to pack each box separately it's a cost and it also leads to shoes getting damaged then there was something even more interesting they did they covered the entire house the wall and the floor with safety or with uh, safety material to ensure that they don't damage the walls of the house they don't damage the floor of the house and it's all reusable so you can reuse it a certain number of times and this will ensure that your current house does not get damaged and they use the same method to move it to the house that you're moving to so let me show you again so this is protective material to cover the walls to cover the floors then even more interesting when they were packing items from a from any cupboard what they did was they created an index so that they know what is placed where so if there are four drawers or five drawers they would create an index and this is how organized they would become and then they will place it and mention that this is from drawer number five or drawer number four and then there is another interesting thing they do they use color coding for different boxes if it's a fragile box it's a different color if it's not a fragile box it's a different color and these are very simple principles we are not even looking at something which is too complex and i wanted to pick up something which is very simple and how you can apply this in your daily lives now even when they have to move something as heavy in this like this they created a tool to do so so take a look so this is protective covering again so they cover it then they create a temporary handle and this makes it easier to move so this is a red tape for fragile item then they also created another method for quickly packing dishes so this is for the television so this is a television box that they use one person can carry up to 43 inch televisions there is no issue with it and it stays safe it reduces the requirement of resources because you don't need two people to move one television you can just use one and then it's easy to move so let me show you another example and this will be for the dishes they also realize that packing each 
played separately is time consuming and on top of that there is a probability that if i pack each plate separately it takes more space if any of you had to do that in, in the recent years if you had to use a bubble pack it takes more space so they created a tool in which they can just place the plate safely and the glasses and there are multiple boxes all of these are reusable now why am i showing you this example it's not that you are in movers and packers industry what i'm trying to help you understand here is most of these ideas were generated from bottom of the pyramid they were not generated by the ceo or the vice president or uh, some senior manager they were all generated from the bottom of the pyramid and that is the philosophy they could drive they could drive a philosophy that let's look at how many plates we have broken so data driven let's look at how many televisions were broken or how many complaints we got and then prioritize those complaints and start asking what kind of solutions we can generate so when you look at lean six sigma in your organization this is how you can look at it you begin with standardizing existing process establishing scorecards reviewing your scorecard kpis periodically and then initiating corrective action and preventive action then you start looking at how you can apply a structured roadmap for process product or service improvement there you can ask two questions the question is do i need incremental improvement or do i need radical change incremental improvement dmaic define measure analyze improve and control and define measure analyze improve and control is also based on the same five questions so when you look at define you are still asking the same question what should we improve measure you're still asking the same question what is our current performance and gap analyze what are the factors responsible for gap improve how do we bridge these gaps and control how do we sustain improved performance the five questions remain the same whether it's dmaic dma dv or whether you want to apply it as a management framework or a management system now when you look at a management system your objective is that everything that we do in our organization is guided by these five or five questions and when you reach the maturity of philosophy then the objective is how do i get everybody in the organization to think about process improvement to think about waste reduction to think about variation reduction now before um, i take this any further let me talk about problem solving as a challenge now why is all of this so important and motorola learned it the hard way that problem solving is not as simple as it appears it is not as simple as it appears because most people jump to conclusions measure analyze goes missing we directly go to improve and if you want to understand this a little better you may have some family members or relatives friends and family so whenever you are sick or you are ill maybe you have cold and cough or maybe you have an upset stomach before they even diagnose you a lot of them start prescribing a solution and this is a big pain so the objective of dmaic dma dv and lean six sigma in general is 
that we don't want to start prescribing an out prescribing a solution or a template before diagnosis so the objective is that the organization should recognize the importance of asking the five questions to improve existing processes and one of the best examples of this that we have seen in india and we have benefited from it in india is somebody like ramila ben so this is from 2013 and i wanted to share this 2012 i thought it was 2013 so i apologize i think that is livable income now before you start thinking oh she may have too many cows no she spent a lot of time in israel and something interesting you should know israel and certain parts of europe they worked on lean six sigma as a concept the guiding concept remains the same they didn't call it really lean six sigma as a concept for improving dairy farming and one of the easiest examples for you to understand would be let's consider this is your pain area there's a problem statement the problem statement is the actual milk production in our dairy farm was 20% less than the budgeted production last year what should we do so whenever we ask this question to most people they start prescribing solutions instead of asking why instead of asking why and let me share an interesting real life scenario when it comes to this so why was our production milk production less than budgeted so israel started looking at a bunch of questions so they started asking why one of the primary reasons that they identified was cow was sick or on medication and therefore couldn't be milked then they said okay why then the next answer was the cow had uh, open wounds some lesions rashes allergy and therefore or some kind of skin infection and therefore on antibiotics and other medication then the next question was why open wounds because cows can scratch themselves and they hurt themselves when they scratch and another reason was cows would rest on wet floor and when we say wet floor it is generally their urine and this can lead to rashes etc then the next question that we even had was why do they scratch themselves and we came up with this question scratching there were two reasons one was just pleasure the other was some kind of allergy or irritation and then we started saying why do they have these allergies irritation skin infection and some of you may know this method as the five whys and we came up with a few scenarios and one of the interesting scenarios here was that cow dung always in the barn so that leads to fleas insects etc cows don't wash their feet when they walk into the barn so this leads to mastitis or some kind of infection for you to understand uh, cows scratch themselves uh, sorry cows rest on wet floor urine that's another concern and another thing was cows eat in a dining space contaminated by their own defecation 
Now, the reason why I'm picking this as an example, this is what has transformed India's ability to produce milk. And we don't realize this because this does not hog uh, the headlines of television news channels. Over the last 10, 15 years, India has spent a lot, most Indian dairy farmers have spent a lot of time in Israel trying to understand ways to reduce waste and improve consistency. So if you ever get an opportunity, this is what you should search, Gujarat Farmers Tel Aviv. Then you'll find Israel to gift 100 units and so on. And then you can look at Israel, a center of excellence, India. So they have done it across dairy farming, agriculture, others. Now, when you actually go and observe what they have done, they found the solution to all of this. So they looked at some of the pain areas. They said, and this is where they asked, how do we provide a safe scratching experience to a cow? Can you imagine this was a discussion? And we have to do it in Please keep in mind, we have to do it in little to no cost. So there is one big constraint that we already have. Cost as less as possible. If no cost, that is even better. Then the next question was, how do we ensure that there is no excreta in the dining space? How do we ensure that cows don't rest on wet floor? How do we ensure compliance to feet washing in cows? How do we also ensure that the cow dung doesn't stay on the floor for more than two hours. And many more questions. And let me show you some other interesting examples. And they had to keep in mind it is dairy farming. It is not some fancy uh, software development. And this is where you should know they hired a bunch of um, technology experts to work on technological solution and engineering solutions. So let me start with how did they get the cows to scratch themselves? And this is something we already use in India. This is not an Indian facility, but we use the same solution in India. This is a motion sensor scratching pod for the cows. So the cows use this. This is a lot, this is a significantly safer way for them to scratch themselves instead of using uh, instead of scratching against sharp objects i like the tagline if you care about the cows then there was something even more interesting they did they changed the they changed the design of the cattle shed now if you look at the design of the cattle shed you would find that they have sand beds and this and it's a elevated sand bed with slatted floors the objective was that the cow will now not have to rest on a wet floor and they use slatted floors so that the floors can be cleaned much faster so there was a change in design of their resting space. Similarly, what they did was they used a barn cleaner to clean the barn, which is a simple robotic barn cleaner, nothing too fancy. And we are using barn cleaners in India too. This takes away majority of the dung, which reduces the number of insects, fleas, and others. Then what else did they do? They did something even more interesting. 
they change the design of the dining space so that the cows so that the cows can only keep their heads in the dining space inst and the dung will not get impacted by it now the purpose of this entire discussion is that when you look at lean six sigma as principles these principles apply anywhere it can be a cattle shed it can be movers and packers one of the things that i i was discussing with dr call yesterday and i mentioned that there is this very interesting book and dr call would probably be sharing which is how lean has been applied in library uh, and information sciences so this is lean for librarians in theory and practice some very interesting case studies uh, i've requested Dr. Call to see the feasibility if this can be shared with all of you. And when you get an opportunity, you can go through some of the case studies here on how they've looked at using Lean Six Sigma for reducing cost at a British library. They have looked at improving belief efficiency at the University of Nottingham. They have looked at reducing reshelving time at the University of St. Andrews. They've increased uh, increasing library usage at University of Cambridge. Now, you should not limit yourselves to these case studies. I have shared this book with Dr. Call, and I've requested her to see if it's possible for her to share it with all the attendees. But the objective is that when you look at Lean Six Sigma, you should only ask yourself five questions. And the five questions that, that we spoke about are what should we improve? What is our current performance and gap? What are the factors responsible for gap? How do we bridge these gaps and how do we sustain improved performance? And when you ask these questions, you find ways to reduce waste, reduce variation, reduce inconsistency, bring about more profits to your enterprise and improve the kind of quality of service that you can provide to your enterprise and keep an open mind that it doesn't have to be manufacturing it can be dairy farming it can be movers and packers it can be libraries it can be software development it can be banking and financial enterprises but the five questions remain the same in all with that i will conclude my presentation i hope it has been enriching i will be happy to take questions from everybody Thank you very Thank much, you. Dr. Shantanu, for delivering a very excellent talk. Each and every word of wisdom spoken holds great promise and also relevance for the library and information science professionals. Uh, thank you for sparing time and thank you very much you know, for your very kind efforts in uh, familiarizing us all about Six Sigma and Lean Six Sigma, and especially the kind of examples given by you that uh, I think each one of us are going to remember. We would like to make the best use of our ability and uh, hence, you know, I'm making the floor open for questions. We have fairly a good number of participants in this discussion who are uh, who have joined us from various parts of the country and also from outside. We are making the floor open for taking the questions. Would like to request our attendees, if you may like to pose a question to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Shantanu, please kindly raise your digital hand and we'll be very very happy to give you an audio control. We could see that we have a question coming in from uh, Dr. Kiran from Bangalore, from Dr. Rangesh Dental College. Dr. Kiran, I have unmuted you, requesting you to please unmute yourself and you can ask the question. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Hello, please good afternoon. Go ahead. Um, I, Introduce no, yourself some, and ask the question. Uh, in, yeah. in between the session, I had some uh, distinct clarifications. I cleared, madam, when. Uh, Sorry, he was okay. explaining. I remember. Uh, okay, clarified okay, that. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kiran. We have Dr. Usha Munshi, the chief librarian from India International Center, New Delhi. And uh, I have unmuted you, Dr. Munshi. Could, can I request you to please unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much, Dr. Shantanu, for such a, you know, a complex issue, but a simple solution by you. That's how I put it. I what I was uh, wondering is whether it is possible to measure the service quality of a service industry organization with the six sigma, lean six sigma. Thank you so much for your kind words. 
Absolutely. So if you look at majority of our clients today, and this is the change that has happened. If you look at even the Var Sigma client list, I would say 80 to 90 percent of the Var Sigma client list today are non-manufacturing enterprises. And that's the reason we have moved away from the traditional definition of Lean Six Sigma. You can still have measurable parameters. Of course, it may not be in kilograms, liters, meters, so you may not have those dimensions, but you can always look at ratings, you can look at turnaround time. So these can be some good measurable parameters, occupancy percentage, utilization percentage. Recently, we were talking to Elsevier, and one of the key discussions we were talking about is content consumption percentage and content recall percentage and content revisit percentages. And it was a very interesting discussion for their clinical products. So uh, we have a healthcare consulting team and we also work with some of these CRO organizations. We're currently working with Elsevier also. The entire discussion was that the traditional way of consuming content has gone away. How do we measure it? So content consumption, the traditional way versus now. And how do we increase content consumption? How can we increase content recall? How do we measure this? How do we measure the quality of the content? So there was a big discussion around the quality of the content. We were looking at measurable parameters. So to come back to your question, the answer to your question is majority of the organizations today implementing Lean Six Sigma are service sector organizations. Even difficult issues like content today gets measured. A lot of that is thanks to organizations like YouTube. Uh, thanks to organizations like Hogarth, who find ways to measure your content based on length, based on percentage consumed, percentage revisited. And they also look at uh, how quickly you could provide a service, how quickly you could troubleshoot, how many times somebody had to contact you to get something done, number of touch points. So more the number of touch points before the service is provided, worse the quality is that's how we look at it. So if somebody has to come to you and they have to hop multiple touch points, that is an indicator of bad service quality. So that's another discussion. Even in websites today, when we look at quality of a website, we talk about number of clicks to an action or an outcome. So those are the things that actually drive measurements today. And there are some very interesting websites that you can look at. One thing I would urge you to look, considering all of your academics, is a website user lane it is about guided content consumption userlane.com oh, my screen is still on screen sharing i can quickly show you this some of our clients as a solution are now using user lane for content consumption for training just allow me a moment let me take you to the primary page so this is launch content faster so experience the user lane content creation engine interactive step by step and then you start looking at how can you guide new users how do you enhance user experience how do you reduce manual support so if you look at the taglines on the left how do you increase product adoption and there are measurable parameters everywhere and you would find these consulting organizations using it for their clients So there is a lot of work happening in the digital space. And even if you come to Var Sigma's website, you would see that nowadays, when we even propose Lean Six Sigma solutions, we are talking about digital transformation. And the reason why we are talking so much about digital transformation, majority of the measurement of service quality and improvement of service quality is through that digital transformation space. So I not, I can't comment on how you can improve library services because you would be the best judge of it but one of the things that i would know for that i i can say for sure service quality digital transformation are slowly becoming synonymous okay thank you thank you so much Thank you very much, Dr. Munshi, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shantanu, for a very exhaustive reply on this. We have a lot many uh, attendees who are wanting to ask a question, so we are going to take a more of your time, uh, Dr. Shantanu. Uh, hope, yeah, thank you. We have Mr. Doodle Rajeshwar from Hyderabad, who is there with us from CMR College. Mr. Doodle Rajeshwar, could you please unmute yourself? I have sent you an unmute request. 
thank you madam thank you uh, dr shantanu kumar sir uh, this is very good uh, experience for us sir as uh, library professionals uh, this is a different uh, uh, webinar uh, we learn a lot of things uh, from you today how could we improvement ourselves sir is there any ideas from your side to develop our library because nowadays in these uh, days pandemic situations uh, students are coming very less and use uh, that uh, their digital libraries so is there any ideas from your side uh, please guide us sir thank you so much for your kind words that's, that's very kind of you grateful i will be the devil's advocate and say something different and i hope nobody uh, all 400 participants do not get upset with my response i would like india to start thinking of content curation in a digital world i am immensely upset that we don't have a coursera or a edx and if you don't know the websites coursera is a, MOOC, a massive open online course network or edx and i'm surprised that some of the iams are uh, hosting their content on uh, edx i i think not not on coursera but on edx and i would like the library professionals to move away from the traditional library setup if you look at content consumption, more than libraries, I can talk about content consumption. That's the space I'm in. So we, we discuss on content consumption. Your traditional reading and comprehension content consumption is only going to go down. And we will have to find ways of creating products like Audible. Why does Amazon have to come up with Audible or acquire Audible? Why can't we think of an Audible for our country? I spend at least 15 to 30 minutes every night on Audible. Uh, so if any of you don't know what is Audible, or I, I'm presuming most of you would, but Audible is all uh, audiobooks. And I spend at least 30 minutes every night. There are two reasons for it. First, I find it immensely value adding. And second, uh, it helps me sleep. And I also have this cognitive dissonance if I don't study every day. So if I don't study something for the 15, 30 minutes every day, I have this feeling of guilt. If we can slowly move towards products like Audible within university. So what my recommendation would be the critical topics, you can move to audio content and start sharing more podcast. It doesn't need to be a video content. Video content is difficult to produce, but you can at least move to audio content. The consumption of audio content goes away. So your traditional job profiles of librarians will move from the physical workspace to a digital workspace where you start identifying what kind of books, what needs to be moved to audio, what needs to be moved to audio visual, what can move to more audio visual interactive content, how can it be available to your students, and that would be the new job profile. The physical libraries, of course, things will get, get a lot better after the, the COVID pandemic gets over, but it will still never be the same. Easiest way to understand, I had a British Council Library membership many, many years ago. The day I got Audible, I'm sorry, I don't have that anymore. It's not that I didn't see value in it, it's just inconvenient. You drive there, you park your vehicle, then you have to find the books, do all of that, much of a challenge. So my recommendation to any librarian, if you're looking at the future of content consumption, you have to look at audio, audiovisual, podcasts, and you will have to move to content like uh, Audible, Coursera, edX. That's the future. And that's what I really want. I really want an Indian enterprise with Audible. And I would be the first member the day it is available. Uh, okay, sir. Thank you thank very you so much, much. Uh, Mr. Rajeshwar and Dr. Shantanu. You will be very pleased to know about it as we are already aware that Delnet, we network around 7,000 institutions, academic, R&D bodies, all different kind of institutions. And very shortly, in yet another one month time, we have plans to launch uh, that 
portal called Vision Video Sites Online on 5th of September. And that is exactly in tune with what you had required, you know, had the desired because we also felt the same. And we are creating this portal wherein already there would be the videos, lectures available, and then making the portal available to our member institutions. And we are launching it as a best practice practices uh, for, uh, um, uh, uh, this is a knowledge sharing and intellectual knowledge sharing, the human expertise knowledge sharing among our member institutions. And the portal will be available wherein they can upload an individual institution can upload the lectures, any kind of a talk. It can be an audio. We also feel the same thing that it's sometimes there are institutions. We are from the low bandwidth areas. They come and they're not able to see the videos. But if you can have an audio content available, which they can just can hook up through even their mobile devices on all their systems from varied bandwidths, even if they are coming in. So we are working already on that. We are creating that very major big portal and we would have you as a special guest uh, when we launch that. So do please block 5th of September because we have plans to launch it on that day and that would be called a Delnet Vision Portal. The video sites online, making it available to our institutions to upload their lectures and they would be a kind of and who is who also available because it would be experts there. So anyone wanting in a particular field, uh, any kind of an experts, human experts available in our country, they would be able to use that resource. And uh, so that's our contribution that we are trying to make for the country. So Excellent I was, news. Uh, you, wanting... you, probably the best news I've heard today. <laughs> In a while. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And you need to block 5th of September because you would be the, the special guest, you know, on that day. We, and we would mention it also that you desired it also and you express the need. And we have we are already working on that. So thank sure. you so very yeah. much. Uh, we can see that couple of more of our attendees who may li like to ask a question. Good yes. evening, Dr. Smita ma'am, and good evening, Dr. Shantanu, sir. Uh, it is very immense pleasure for me to attend this webinar and uh, my question to you Dr. Shantanu is that as I'm a school librarian and uh, uh, if I'm going to apply, if I'm going to automate my library along with the application of Lean Sigma uh, principles and methodology and um, which what the scenario is I'm facing that I'm the sole person in the whole library and as you know librarians are not directly connected with the management system they only have a meeting as well. uh, they only have a meeting like along with principals or like some of the administrative staff not with the higher authorities so if i'm going to apply this six sigma methodology while doing library automation or something else to promote our library services to make our library services effective then how could i do that because it is a teamwork absolutely i agree with you thank you so much for your kind words again I agree Thank with you. you. Uh, Lean Six Sigma as a framework has to be a top-down approach, and of course, it has to engage all levels of the pyramid. However, just because you may not have the management support should not stop you from progressing further. So my recommendation would be to look at some simple things. You can just look at what is it that you do every day, morning till evening, five days a week, and ask yourself what are the activities which are wasteful? and ask yourself how can i get rid of these wasteful activities or reduce the time invested in these wasteful activities now if any of those activities requires significant management management support you may delay it but i'm quite certain you will be able to identify some of the activities in your day monday to friday 20 25 days a month that you can eliminate to make more space for yourself and something that I would strongly recommend, because you're a school librarian, you should spend at least 15 to 20 hours a week for the next two years building expertise for yourself on content development, content curation, and how to keep pace with digital technology. I have a lot of friends uh, who have been library professionals or in content development mode, and I'm referring to some of our friends from NIIT who were doing it for the West. So it was an outsource office and they were doing it for the West, for America. Their job profiles have changed overnight. So one of the things that I would urge you to do is list down everything that you do morning till evening, five days a week, 
whatever you think you can eliminate eliminate it whatever you think you can do with some support from management do that and then spend some time learning some of the new tools and uh, techniques on content curation content development and digital transformation i understand that you may not be able to automate the entire process because you may need support from it you may need support from different departments you may have to park that for later you may have to create a proposal and it may take six months one year to get that proposal going but nobody is stopping you today from making your day lighter by eliminating wasteful activities so that would be my recommendation thank you very much dr shantanu ah. for a very very inspiring reply to the question posed by ashwarya thank you uh, we uh, have good afternoon dr shantanu this is dr janaki ravan from andhra pradesh uh, my okay. question is how can we use the lean six sigma tool in order to improve the library services in the university library system and also the what is the critical process when applying this tool into the university library system now that's a broad question and i don't think i can really answer the exact steps in couple of minutes but this is how i look at it why does a library exist you have to ask yourself what's the mission and vision of any library you want to serve content you want to build skills for your students who are your customers now the question is you have to ask yourself what are the pain areas are we getting enough students in the libraries are we getting students to consume content are we able to provide the content that the student wants when they want it as fast as we can how do we ensure that the content is updated how do we ensure that the content is relevant a lot of these can be pain areas which can be projects for you to work on i can talk about some of the libraries that we have looked at from it products perspective so we worked with some of some of the it companies and they were building small libraries within within their organization now these are still 10000 20000 people firm and they are in it environment and they did an entire project on identifying the kind of content how to serve the content how quickly can we serve it to them and the entire process from content procurement development to serving the content they they revamp that entire process so they found a way that you can even book your books on your mobile phones you can uh, look at availability based on when somebody else has taken a book and when is that person supposed to return you can also request that person to return faster a lot of it can help you improve the service quality even if you're not doing digitization and even right from cataloging shelving reshelving if you're billing then billing efficiencies if somebody has to wait in a queue it is poor service quality if somebody has to go to multiple people it is poor service quality all of these will be opportunities for improvement now every university library would have its own challenges maybe you don't have the books that you need so how do we procure them so those will be different questions but this is how i would urge you to look at it ask yourself what is it that the students professors or anybody is upset about what is it that your team members the librarians your support team are upset about and those are the pain areas that we need to address using a structured methodology so that would be my response thank you very much dr shantanu for the reply okay here in comes a question in the chat box from vijay kumar verma from iit delhi uh, for you dr shantanu what would be the role of technology in near future in lean six sigma process thank you so much for, for the question and as i mentioned earlier that in the last 5 to 10 years digital transformation whenever we talk about digital transformation we are talking about technology the entire lean six sigma as a framework when we look at solutions if you recollect we asked that there were five questions the fifth question is how do we bridge these gaps in the last 10 years when we talk about how do we bridge these gaps and we generate solutions our dependence on technology has significantly increased but at the same point in time we still need the intelligence the intellect of humans to know what kind of technology to use and where do we look at technology for rule based activities and where do we use humans for cognitive functioning so there is already a lot of discussion uh, on even on automation that how intelligent can an automation be 
where do we have a handoff between a human and technology? But answering his questions directly, another five to 10 years, if you're not comfortable with technology, if you're not comfortable with digital transformation, you can't be a Lean Six Sigma professional either. So a lot of the traditional Lean Six Sigma professionals today find it difficult to drive improvement initiatives in some of the organizations because they probably are still in the manual mode. A lot of that has changed and technology drives majority of these improvement initiatives. And its dependence is going to only increase. Thank you very much, Dr. Shantanu. We have yet another one question from Mrs. Sheetal Deshpande, the librarian at Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital and Research Center from Pune. And her question is, how beneficial is KYC prior to implementing Lean Six Sigma at a library? So I think she means know your customer. Is that the... Exactly, exactly. Yes, yes. Prior to implementing Lean Six Sigma. So whenever we talk about any Lean Six Sigma implementation, we talk about the maturity continuum. You may not be applying Lean Six Sigma tools directly until you reach the stage of metric maturity. That means you have standardized processes, you have a scorecard, and you have a process of reviewing scorecards periodically, and then looking at some kind of a project. So yes, you need to know, so if they're library. looking at library as a customer, of course, until we know the kind of maturity that library is at, we may not have to initiate a Lean Six Sigma project. We probably can benefit only with metric level of maturity. That means standardized processes, ensuring that there is a scorecard, ensuring there is review of those scorecard parameters and corrective action, preventive action. Once any library reaches that stage, and then we ask ourselves, what is the purpose of that library? And once again, it comes down to vision and mission. And the KYC should cover that for the library. What is it that they want to do? Yeah, why do they exist? What is success for them? Based on that, the next steps will be decided. So you, you don't have one template that, that's going to fit all. And that would be an unfortunate approach by any consultant if he or she just wants to apply one template to any business, not just to library. So yes, we need to understand the business really well, whether it's a library, whether it's a dairy farm, and the purpose of that business to exist. Thank you very much, Dr. Shant. This is now going to be the last question. We, you have already accommodated us and given us so much of time. And this last question is from Mr. Venkata Rao P from Institute of Public Enterprise from Hyderabad. And his question is, how do you distinguish between QMS, ISO 9001-2015 and Six Sigma? That's exactly what I had covered right here. So the first level, when we talk about standardized existing processes, this is when we are talking about ISO standardization and we are talking about quality management systems. So we expect you to apply the ISO principles of QMS and other standards, depending on the kind of business you are, and that's when we start talking about standardized existing process. And this is exactly was the answer to the previous question also, that if the organization is not at this level of maturity, I will not even think of moving further. So yes, ISO QMS is the starting point before we even think of leading Lean Six Sigma projects in any enterprise. And it doesn't need to be a certification. If you apply the practices in principle, so if you look at it as a principle, if you apply it and as in spirit, if you apply it, that's good enough, even if you don't have a certification. Thank you very much, Dr. Shantanu. And uh, with this, we have uh, towards the closure of the program. We are much indeed grateful to you, Dr. Shantanu, for uh, delivering one of our most enlightening uh, talk, which has definitely created a lot much of interest. And that's also making us to feel as if, you know, we may have to request you maybe after one or two months time to do an exclusive program for academic libraries. Six Sigma implementation in the academic environment in the academic institutions who have been really so kind in acceding to our request to reschedule your own uh, engagements and to be there with us this afternoon because we have been into the most uh, 
you know, challenging kind of uh, times. And you came to our rescue and helped us with such a wonderful talk, which has created. And as we could see, not many of our professionals, there are so many other questions which are still there in the chat box. But because of paucity of time, we are not in a position to take them. We just want to also thank you very much for sharing the copy of the book that we are going to send it across to all our attendees. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful expertise that we hold. And I can also can assure you from Dalent that we would also like to go for the Lean Six Sigma implementation for Dalent processes. So I was discussing with you yesterday that this looks to be that yes, uh, we are going to have more, many more collaborations. And after your this wonderful presentation and the wonderful work that you and your entire team is doing, we really would like to take the things forward and to see to it how we can refine the processes in our libraries because all of us would like to see to it that we are in a position to uh, bring that kind of a change, what we really desire to do. And we know that you are going to, you know, give us and offer your splendid and stupid the support that you have already done and your expertise would really help us a lot. So once again, on behalf of Delnet, a warm sincere thanks and each one of our attendee of this program, we are indeed, indeed much grateful to you. I'm also much grateful to a wonderful colleague that I have come across at War Sigma, who was instrumental in getting us connected with Dr. Shantanu Kumar. Megha was the one who made it possible for us. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank her in, and also on behalf of Delnet. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Megha. Without your uh, timely help, that to in the very awkward hours uh, it's because of her that we have been able to reach out strong values that we talk about we are able to notice it that's very much evident in everyone at war sigma so thank you very much dr shantanu i'm also much grateful uh, to each one of our attendee uh, who uh, not only each one of you just participated but very much active and an engaging audience that uh, all of you have been so many thanks for being there with us this afternoon and it, this has definitely opened up as we could see from the conversations from the discussions this is something that we would like to take it forward so we have today made a beginning uh, with uh, dr shantanu kumar and with his entire setup of war sigma and we can uh, assure you that in the days to come we would really like to seek your expertise especially for seeing to it that how libraries what are the kind of new things that they can think about and standardizing it with the state of the art protocols which are in place and we would be very happy to have collaborations done with war sigma uh, to see to it that we we can do something for our library sector so thank you very much and i would also like to thank uh, my own colleagues uh, Mr. Kushal Goswami, who was coordinating it technically uh, this webinar, and also Mrs. Ranjana for making it possible for us to have this webinar. So once again, Dr. Shantanu, we can't really mm -hmm. thank you enough. It, it was a, surely a great honor and a pleasure to have you with us in this webinar. And we really look forward to having many more opportunities. And Delnet would also like to uh, approach War Sigma and uh, to see to it that how we can bring in and implement uh, as a uh, maybe as a case study, we can start off with Delnet, uh, which can the libraries can consider it as a uh, uh, as a as a model wherein they can think about replicating the same in their own institutions too at the same time so thank you very much once again dr shantanu and if you would like to just say some concluding words to our attendees you have been truly an inspirational uh, and enlightening speaker and we really feel uh, so much pleasure to have you thank you so much i i can't tell you it's i'm grateful that i got an opportunity to work with delnet because I, we have used delnet services and i told you that that before the advent of all these new audible kind of services delnet was mainstay i think it has been for last 30 years as 30 far as years, i recollect yes, yeah. <laughs> And so that has been the mainstay and you're the largest uh, in APAC region. So I am grateful. I'm immensely right. thankful, Pleasure. immensely honored Pleasure. Uh, Pleasure. To, to work with you. And I'm grateful Thank to you. all the participants who uh, patiently heard me, asked questions, and I hope I could make a contribution to your learning, to your life. So I'm grateful again. Thank you so much. Thank and I'll be happy okay. to work with Delnet and other attendees. So thanks again. I, I just can't thank you now. Immensely grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shantanu. And uh, thank you so much, each one of you, for being there and for making the session a memorable one. Uh, stay happy, stay blessed, and do stay connected. 
it has been a great pleasure and honor for Delnet to have each one of you with us this afternoon. Thank you very much, and we really look forward to having you back again. Thank you very much, Dr. Shantanu, once again on behalf of each one of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.